the calendar that is set by the lectionary actually allows us to go through a big chunk of the Bible in a systematic order so that we actually know. It starts in Advent, which is, uh, I think, next month. Yeah, It starts with the preparing for the second coming of Christ, and then it goes into the birth of Christ and Christmas. Then it goes into Epiphany, then it goes into Lent, and then it goes into Good Friday and Easter Sunday, then it goes into Pentecost, and then after 26 weeks of all that, the season after Pentecost is a full half year, half year from somewhere in May up to November, where we look at the cost of discipleship. What it takes to be a follower of Christ. So as I was given the passage that we heard just now, Matthew 22, the first thing that struck me was, who do you work for? Or who do I work for? Just a quick show of hands. Uh, uh, anyone, you just can. How many of you work eight hours a day? Flat, no more, no less. Can I see your hands? That means you say, I will work eight, I won't work more, I won't work less. Oh, oh, one person, thank you. How many of you work more than eight hours a day? Who? How many, I assume you work five days a week. How many of you work more than five days a week? Wow. How many of you, even though you leave your work in the office, when you go home, you still bring your work home in here? Ah, see, so many. My goodness, we actually spend a lot of time doing work. Which is fine. We are generally, I believe, responsible people. But we spend a lot of our minds, our strength, doing work, which is okay. But then, ah, let me give you an example. When you meet someone at a wedding reception or during a dinner party, when someone say, Hi, I am John and you are, how do you usually identify yourself? For me, the first thing I'll say is I'm John, so that people remember my name. Then I will usually say I work for so and so. Uh, I work for this company or that company, and I do this. I realize that a lot of my personal identification is based on what I do, where I work for, and I'm also wearing my office T-shirt now. in a BLC meeting in Luther Center. You can see that it's actually the same picture. People say, aren't you bored? Five days a week, you go to office, you do office things, and then during your weekends, you wear things that remind you of the office somehow. I told people, <laughs> no, actually, uh, since work for them, promote a bit. Uh. <laughs> they do a bit of marketing. They're my employer, uh, anyway. After smiling and going home, and then I talk to myself, as I thought deeper, what am I actually doing? Am I actually being so proud of my employer that I promote them all the time? Do I see myself as an employee of this? Do I identify myself based on who I am or what I do? Then I realize, okay, okay, I think I better slow down. Rather than look at myself based on what I do, which I do all the time, I decided to hmm, if let's say I were to introduce myself based on what I am, or who I am, then who am I? As I thought back, that since I go to church, I still know how. So, I, I think I identify myself as a follower of Christ. But what does that mean? Easy to say, but is it easy to do or not? What does it mean to follow Christ? That's when this particular scripture came into the picture. Now come with me to Jesus' time. I hope you can see and I'm not blocking the, the picture there. Jesus was in the middle of his ministry. He has a whole crowd following him, very crowded. But he has two groups of people who came to see him that day. They intended to track him. Who are they? They are the Pharisees and their disciples and also the Herodians. Who are these people? Isn't it normal for people to come and just disturb Jesus once in a while? Quite normal, right? But is it normal for these two groups of people to come together? The Pharisees are, as they say, the religious leaders of that time. They are the pastors and priests and, and preachers and all that. So they are very religious and they are very staunch Jewish, uh, 
Jews. They followed the Jewish law. So of course, that time during the Roman, Roman Empire, they, 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 they don't like the Roman people because to them, they are waiting for the Messiah. So they have one agenda on their mind. The Herodians, on the other hand, are people who are also Jewish, but they support King Herod, and King Herod was their king at the time. However, actually, he is controlled by the Roman Empire as well. So they have their own agenda. Why do you have two groups of people with differing agendas come together to plot against Jesus? Have you heard of that saying? The enemy of my enemy may be my friend. Is that true? They, they thought it's true. They decided to, why not we gather together, gather strength and attack the guy? Because he threatens us. So they decided to speak to him. And they decided to ask him, now before you, you go against someone, you must always soften him up first. Huh? So when you approach people, you soften him up by, by telling him things like this. Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth. And you show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Even though that's true, but Jesus knows them for who they are. Trying to make it nice first, nice, nice first before they before they do something like that. Okay, one simple question they ask: Tell us what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? In this case, the emperor that time can be seen in this coin that he asked for. He said, "Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites?" He generally knows that that these two groups of people, firstly, they heard him speak so many times before, they actually don't agree with him. So the fact that they actually praise him first and then ask him questions some more, pretending to want an opinion, to listen to his wisdom, actually, they're just trying to trap him. How does the threat go? If he were to answer, yes, you should pay tax to the Roman Empire, then the, the Pharisees will say, ha ah, ha you see? He says pay tax to the Roman Empire. He actually supports the Roman Empire. Jewish people at that time may not be happy because they were oppressed and depressed and suppressed and all kinds of press. And they generally were looking and waiting for a Messiah. And now the so-called Messiah is saying paying tax to the Empire. How can? The Herodians are waiting for him to say, no, don't pay tax to the Roman Empire. You should just serve God and give everything to God. Then the Herodians will say, Aha! You say so, God, you don't respect the Empire. I will tell King Herod and we will tell the Roman Empire that you are trying to come up with a rebellion, you are coming up with a revolution and we will put you in jail. So how? What shall Jesus do? What shall he say? So he did the most obvious thing and said, show me a coin. And in, on that coin, that's the picture of the Roman Emperor. And then he said, Okay. Who said is this? Whose title? And they said the emperor. And then this whole story is encapsulated in this answer that he gives. One liner only, but one liner he managed to silence all of them. What does he say? Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and give to God things that are God's. Quite obvious and straightforward, right? Anyone who can give that kind of answer. But it came from Jesus and they were not prepared for it. What does it mean? Let's say I'm the Pharisees, I'll be. What? Give to the emperor, came up. And then the second part of the sentence says, Give to God everything that is God. Oh, okay, they got nothing to say. And then the Herodians. Give to the emperor things are of the emperor, okay? No? So, so you actually acknowledge the emperor also. What is Jesus actually saying here? As they left him, what do we see here? Generally, personally, I feel that we do need to fulfill our responsibilities as people. Yeah? You are a person living in a particular place, fulfilling responsibilities as a, as a son, as a daughter, as a mother, as a father, as a brother, as a sister, as an uncle, auntie, grandfather, grandmother. Did I cover everyone? Uh, employer, employee, citizen, ruler. I don't know who you rule, but never mind. Citizen, ruler, and everyone. You have so many roles to play, and generally, God says, fulfill those roles. But above all, remember, God, give to God things that are God's. What belongs to God? Everything. So even though we are young, we are supposed to fulfill our roles, but at the end of the day, our ultimate allegiance is with God. And a bit further, after uh, Matthew chapter 22, 
verses 15 to 22, when you go to verse 37, when they ask him again, what is the greatest commandment and the famous answer that Jesus gives is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love others as yourselves. Is that an easy thing to do? One liner also. Very easy. Two commandments, put a comma there and it's just one sentence. That's all God asks us to do. Love the Lord your God with all your soul and heart and mind and strength. And then love others as you love yourselves. Very easy to hear, very easy to quote, but I believe impossible to do by ourselves. Hence, being a Christian not so easy, eh? quite complicated and very difficult to achieve. If it were me, I would have given up. Anyway, let's see. This is the picture that Lee mentioned just now about God showing his glory to Moses, but cannot see too much glory because he will be blinded. So God closed his eyes. And, and uh, there's just a cartoon that goes somewhere. But generally, what happened during that time? Last week, we heard Pastor Augustine share that the people of God was impatient. They couldn't wait for Moses to come down to bring down the Ten Commandments. Then they decided to ask the uh, Aaron to, to take all their gold and, and make a calf that they can worship. And at that time, God was already angry with them for doing that. But Moses asked on their behalf for God's forgiveness. God forgave them. And then now, in this particular session, God told Moses, Okay, Moses, you pick up your people, pick up my people, and go. Bring them to the promised land. And did, what did Moses say? As any hard-working worker, I would have expected Moses to say, Okay, thank you for the assignment. I will do it. You can go and disturb other people first, look after other people first, God. I will bring your people to the promised land. If I got a problem, I call you and then you come and help me. Up. Did Moses say that? I would have said that. Actually, I do that all the time. That's terrible. But anyway, Moses didn't do that. He said to God, God, you give me assignment, you give me a, 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 a commandment to look after your people. You ask me to lead them, but you don't want to come with me. If you don't come, I don't want to go. If you expect me to do this for you, I expect you to go with me. <laughs> Cannot see God's face until God closed his face forever. And yet he dares to ask God to go with him. Did God strike him down with lightning? No. God said, okay, because I have, you have found favor in my eyes, I will go with you. What does that mean? The, huge, magnificent God that we feel that is so big and so strong and we are so small yet we can approach him, uh, Moses approached him at that time and he actually relented and decided to show his favour and show his grace by being with his people. Let's compare how does that work today. Uh, the table on the left hand side the people sinned, Moses asked God to forgive them, uh, mediated on their behalf, and God showed grace and forgave them. Today, when we try to do things ourselves and we know we can't, we want to live out the commandment that God has given us, and it is so difficult to live out that kind of commandment. We can ask Jesus to mediate, and He is continuing to mediate for us on our behalf, and God will show grace. That is the promise that we can see in the Exodus portion just now. How do we do that? What shall we do now? We cannot love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength without the help of God. And God has promised and God has shown through His way that He will be there for us. So in terms of hope, we have hope. But what shall we do? Two months ago in July, I think we had a Bible study session uh, somewhere inside there for about a month or so, and the theme was prayer. We covered this particular verse, Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. This verse says, Ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Very generous, very generous statement. But sometimes do we pray all the time and 
get all our prayers answered all the time according to what we want all the time? If you say yes, very good. If you say no, normal. If you say, I don't know, I don't have no pray, never mind. Let's see what this actually means. Generally, the only way we can pray, according to the Bible study that we have discussed that day, the only way we can pray and have our prayer answered is if we know very well the person whom we are praying to. Have you seen this particular picture before? I, I, I took this from, I must claim that this comes from the internet and it's not my own picture. This is a picture of a wine. The wine is generally the trunk of the whole uh, plant. And, and those are the branches, okay? The, the whole passage actually goes like this. Jesus says, I am the vine, and we are the branches. And then, it says also, 11 times in that verse, I think you've heard it before, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, then you will be with me, and we will be together, and we will be very close. If you remain in me, and I remain in you, if you remain united in me, I oh, so many times, 11 times the same words used again and again. Generally, what does it say? It says that if the branches are to bear fruit, it should be attached to the vine. Quite common sense, right? But very often, we, I always tell God, I understand this passage, Lord, but I think uh, for a while, I can detach myself from the vine for a while. I'll do my own thing. And if I cannot bear fruit, then I come and attach back to you. Uh. What kind of plant does that kind of thing? Plants don't do that. Okay, the only way the plant can grow and flourish is to be continually attached to the vine. Let me share you a story from a long, long time ago. Oh my lord. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen these people before? In my nightmares. They are called the new kids on the block. I don't know how many of you are in that generation. I was in that generation. Oh okay, my God. Uh, 20 years ago, is it 20? Uh, about 20 years ago, they were at their peak. I think uh, I was their biggest fan. Oh dear God. <laughs> I, I, I fancied myself as. <laughs> okay, that was when I was 11 years old, okay? Anyway, I was their biggest fan, I believe. I knew how to sing all their songs. I remembered their lyrics by heart. I can even do some of their steps. Not, they are not very good dancers, but I can do a bit. Okay? I knew where they live. I know what are their favorite foods. I know where, where they go for their holidays. I know so much about them. And I believe some of you also have your own icons that you follow. <laughs> uh, football teams and all that. Does anyone pressure you or force you to get to know these people? No, no one forced me to learn how to sing their songs and dance their funny dances and, 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 and walk like them, dress like them. No one asked me to do it. Why did I do that? Crazy, some might say. But yes, crazy. Crazy and very passionately wanting to know them. Okay, this is a funny story. Uh, let me share another one. Uh, Ten years ago, yeah, 10 years ago, I met this lady, uh, that time girl, uh, who uh, now is my wife, <laughs> in college. And I had this desire to know her more and know her better. So what did I do? I spent time in the library studying, because she studies there, isn't it? Uh, I also uh, spent time uh, talking to her, listening to her, playing with her, doing Bible study with her, <laughs> calling her on the phone, waiting for her to call me. When she doesn't call me, I take the initiative to call her. I don't believe at that time she actually forced me to do all that. I did all that willingly. Why? Because I wanted to get to know her better. And then, of course, at that point of time, I actually knew what um, to pray for her. I, oh, yeah, I, I know her needs are once and all that. How do I do that? Does she, does she tell her niece and her wants to everyone around her? I hope not. But I don't think so. <laughs> she only did that when there's a trust built, there's a relationship formed. And that is not something which is forced upon me, I believe. I did that willingly, really, and that is because I want to know that person better. So going back to the...
Going back to this tree and the vine and the branches thing, it is a willingness to be attached to the vine for you know that only when you are attached to the vine that you can grow. So what does it take for us to become a Christ follower? How do we become close enough to God that we can play and it shall be given unto you? The aim is to have a relationship with Jesus. And how do I do that? Well, I, I reflect back on, on uh, my wife and, and, and all the exercises that I do. I, I actually went to play sports with her family. I went swimming with her father. I went jogging with her brothers. I played tennis with her whole family. The moment I got married, I stopped, okay? But that the stop. Stop. Oh, that's why I can't very long. Thank you. But no, no, no. Okay, okay. Generally, generally, those are the things that we do. Genuine things to be in relationship with someone and yet not forced, genuine and willing to just spend time together. That's what we shall do, yeah? So what are some small steps that we can do today? I have made big resolutions at the beginning of the year before to lose weight in general, on January the 1st and by December 25th, I still have four more dinners to go to so I said not necessary, yeah? So because you make big decisions alone, it's not enough you have to take small steps as you go every day to be able to build a relationship A lot of people come up with acronyms and I, I, I thought my son use acronym as well People like to use A, B, C, D so I just wanted to be different and use DCBA. Small steps. Today, let's start small. Let's decide some. Let's decide on something that we can change, so that our relationship with God can be that much closer. It can be simple things, but after deciding, deciding in the head, then commit it in your heart and commit it to God, so that we can start the relationship together. Then believe that the Lord will help you. Don't let it be just a very theoretical thing. Just put it into practice. And then, of course, act by taking the first step. Generally, I'm not very good at making big decisions. But I believe we can always make small decisions and taking action on those small things. Decide to drink a cup of coffee without sugar today. Decide to not eat that plate of nasi lemak tomorrow and we leave it as that and then when tomorrow comes we make small decisions and hopefully I'll be slim again but generally small steps are always easier to handle and easier to manage so I want to close today with reminding us that at the beginning when Jesus said give everything that belongs to God to God it's such a large commandment but we know that from the book of Exodus, God is there to walk with you. You don't have to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love, the, love others as yourself by yourself. God is there with you. So we have hope. Then as we look at Matthew chapter 7, it says, speak to him, talk to him, and build a relationship with him in order to do this. And the relationship building verse is in Matthew. John chapter 15 about the vine and the branches and if you can, don't have to remember the new kids on the block that one can forget but remember the building of a relationship with Jesus and then taking small steps in building that relationship every day yeah. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, even as we decided to take small steps to come closer to you Lord we know that in this time and age, it's not easy. There are many responsibilities. We are juggling careers, life, family. And there are times when we are overwhelmed with external things that we do not remember the internal things. And where at this time, Lord, we want to bring ourselves before you as individuals, as a church, as a family, as part of a bigger community in Bansa, and of course, part of a bigger community in Malaysia, Lord. We commit ourselves to you and we pray, Lord, knowing that from the book of Exodus, you have shown even then that you go with the people who call on you. So we ask today that you come and walk with us, for we cannot, and we cannot walk alone without you there with us, Lord. So come with us.
And even as we remember the vine and the branches, we know, Lord, that times at times we want to chop ourselves away from you and we want to live independent lives, Lord. But we know, Lord, that branches do not survive without being attached to the tree. Lord, draft us back into the vine and help us build this relationship with you, Lord. As we commit this small step to your hands, Lord, we want to think of one thing, one small thing that we can do this coming week, Lord, that will glorify you, that will bring us closer to you. And we pray, your will be done. We commit this into your hands, Lord. And even as we continue this worship today, with the Holy Communion, we are prepared to receive you. And we are waiting with open arms, open hands, open minds, open hearts for you to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.